Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here in Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. Okay, as we know that that it one of the one of the the problems that we're having right now is, of course, war, and it's been a part of human life for well, it's been a part of human life for, for as long as there's actually been human beings in disagreement. That uh, it, rather than uh, you using words and other v- ways of various communications that we just try to kill each other. All right, that's out there and said. Why is it that in our modern era of humanity that everything has to be either polarized or politicized and? Palestine versus Israel, Israel versus Lebanon, Israel versus versus Iran is isn't any different. It is becoming a a a political campaign. When we look at look at things, that there there are innocent people dying. The Media is trying to paint it as that the people have voted in terrorists because they want terrorists to run their country when that's not true. That in many cases that um, warlord factions have taken over the the territory and either you vote the way they, they want you to or they will flat out kill you or they or that there's other economic uh, reasons why your vo- vote was was curbed, and you you heard in um, in a previous episode when I was speaking with um, another friend who is actually in Lebanon who does does not stand with he doesn't stand. For Israel, doesn't stand against Israel. He believes that Israel should, should remain as a state. We shouldn't go backwards. He, but he, at the same time, he believes that Palestine should have um, a place itself, and that the, the Hamas uh, on October seventh, uh, twenty twenty-three, they did wrong, and and they should suffer a consequence for the wrongdoings that that, that they did. But that shouldn't be polarized or politicized. That should just be a thing that we know that if you take hostages, you kill people, that there is a consequence. The same as if you fire rockets at uh, at another country, there is going to be a consequence. If you say that you want peace, eh, but you keep buying weapons... And you keep firing those weapons off, then there there might be a problem with you saying that you want peace. Okay, so at the same time, when we look at other countries that are actually building and supplying those same weapons, you say you want peace, then you should be limiting the the number of weapons that are built and sold. That it should be a, a industry that has a very limited 
a very limited um, profit margin because there is a control on how many weapons are actually out there but you say that you want peace and you say that you don't want the the wars to continue okay then we're going to add another layer to this we're going to add a layer because you're, we're you're going to hear in the in this episode Pierre Pauvier and Justin Trudeau as they speak about the actions that happened in um in in Palestine and Israel uh, from last year and how the war is, war there is is now a year old and how they're commemorating and memorializing the the people who ha- were killed um, a year ago in in uh, Palestine and Israel uh, because the Hamas did something. They are also saying that asking for the mayors and the premiers across Canada to do something about the anti-Semitic protest. But is how they're defining the anti-Semitic protest. If you are saying that another country besides Israel deserves equal rights, then you're being anti-Semitic. Um, there is, um, is along with this, I'm going to share a couple, a couple of photographs that uh, a friend of mine, Bob Homer, uh, took at a rally in Vancouver asking for the United Nations to come up with a solution so that Palestine has a free state. That Palestine will will also be recognized equally as a country. And those types of rallies are now to be deemed, according to Justin Trudeau and Pierre Pauvier, anti-Semitic. That it shouldn't happen. And Justin Trudeau, as the Prime Minister of Canada, is asking premiers and mayors to limit those protests. That is one another another layer, another complete layer. We're also going to hear as Melody Jolie speaks about some of the things that uh, Pierre Pauvier said, and she is now campaigning for the Liberal government against the Conservative government because she starts speaking about um, white supremacy people they could be sitting in parliament on the conservative side of the table okay so she accuses Mr. Povier of speaking out of both sides that he does not curb anti-Semitism in his party so how can he stand in front of a crowd of people and say that he is in support of the Jewish people when he won't curb uh, the white supremacy people that are or get rid of the, the white supremacy people that are in his party. Why does it have to turn into a political campaign? Okay, simply put, and this is my opinion, and take it take it for as my opinion, and not necessarily as as fact, even though there are some facts. Fact that the the whole uh, Zionist movement in the Middle East started well over a hundred years ago. Matter of fact, it can be it might be, be dated as far back as. 
of the 1890s. And a, another fact that um, at the end of World War II that um, the United Nations okay at the time the United Nations was mostly the United States and um, the United Kingdom coming together and deciding that there should be a Jewish state and placing that Jewish state right smack in the middle of the Middle East and landing it in what we now know as Palestine they rounded people up into camps and they moved them from their homes to other places around the Middle East. Okay, and next next fact, okay, that there are probably in the Middle East there, there are. Uh, let's look at let's look at Lebanon for an example. Okay, Lebanon is about sixty percent of the people there practice some form of Christianity. Well, let's let that set for a second, and let's think about what we hear being reported to us by other media sources they're saying that it is a completely Islamic state and that other religions such as Christianity and Judaism aren't allowed to be practiced but yes Christianity and Judaism are openly practiced in Lebanon That before they created the the state of Israel out of uh, it, uh, as part of, of what was Palestine, that there were already Jewish people living in that area before they created it, and they welcomed the the Zionist movement to join in their community and live peacefully among everyone who was there. Well, what happened? Why is it that we see what we do today if those were if if what I just said is even remotely true? So, who is and I'll leave you with this question. Who is really promoting a war? And who and what owns most of the industry that creates the weapons of war today? Okay, so we're, we are going to hear some recordings today uh, from... Um, like I said, uh, we're going to hear from... Justin Trudeau and Pierre Polvier as they were at an address, a very needed address. Let me let me make sure that we got this straight. A very needed address on what is happening um, in the Middle East, and that we do actually need to curb any bigotry towards the the Jewish people in um, Canada, United States, or anywhere else in the world. That does need to actually happen. There. We don't need to see synagogues being blown up or um, or defamed in, in 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 any way. The same as we should not see any mosque or church have that happen, or any other religious center be destroyed or defamed. No, that is wrong. So this this speech does need to happen because we do need to speak. To people so they understand that 
bigotry is not going to be tolerated anywhere in the world. Okay, so we're going to hear from Justin Trudeau and Pierre Pauvier as they do actually make some really important statements about bigotry. We're also going to hear from Antonio Guerreras as he is going to make a statement about um, the happenings and what is ongoing um, in the Middle East. And we're also going to hear from uh, Melanie Jolet as she is speaking about, um, again, what is happening in the Middle East. And, th- and they all are going to make important statements. Understand the importance of eliminating bigotry in the world and the, the importance of eliminating war in our world as you listen to what these global leaders have to say about what is happening in our world right now. Good afternoon, uh, Secretary General. Make some remarks, uh, then we'll have time for one or two questions. The nightmare in Gaza is now entering an atrocious, abominable second year. This has been a year of crisis, humanitarian crisis, political crisis, diplomatic crisis, and a moral crisis. Over the last year, following the horrific terror attacks perpetrated by Hamas on 7 October, Gaza has become ground zero to a level of human suffering that is hard to fathom. More than 41,000 people have been reportedly killed mostly women and children. Thousands more are missing and believed to be trapped under the rubble. Virtually the entire population has been displaced and no part of Gaza has been spared. Journalists have been killed at a level unseen in any conflict in modern times. And humanitarians, those who have dedicated their lives to helping others, are facing unprecedented epic dangers. A record number including so many members of our UN family, have paid with their lives. The vast majority of those killed were part of the backbone of humanitarian relief operations in Gaza, UNRWA. In the midst of all the upheaval, UNRWA, more than ever, is indispensable. UNRWA, more than ever, is irreplaceable. That is why I have written directly to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to express profound concern about draft legislation that could prevent UNRWA from continuing its essential work in the occupied Palestinian territory. Such a measure would suffocate efforts to ease human suffering and tensions in Gaza and indeed the entire occupied Palestinian territory. It would be a catastrophe in what is already an unmitigated disaster. Let's be clear in practical terms what such a measure would mean. Operationally, the legislation would likely deal a terrible blow to the international humanitarian response in Gaza. UNRWA's activities are integral to that response. It's not feasible to isolate one UN agency from the others. It would effectively end coordination to protect UN convoys, offices and shelters, serving hundreds of thousands of people. Without UNRWA, the delivery of food, shelter, and health care to most Gaza's population would grind to a halt. Without UNRWA, Gaza's 660,000 children would lose the only entity that is able to restart education, risking the fate of an entire generation. And without UNRWA, many health, education, and social services would also end in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. If approved, such legislation would be diametrically opposed to the UN Charter and in violation of Israel's obligations under international law. National legislation cannot alter those obligations. And politically, such legislation would be an enormous setback to sustainable peace efforts and to a two-state solution, fanning even more instability and insecurity. This draft legislation comes at a situation in which Gaza is in a death spiral. 
the latest developments in the north are especially dire. We are witnessing a clear intensification of military operations by Israel. Residential areas have been attacked, hospitals ordered to evacuate, and electricity cut off, with no fuel or commercial goods allowed in. Around 400,000 people are being pressed yet again to move south to an area that is overcrowded, polluted, and lacking the basics for survival. Consider the situation for a family in the Jabalia refugee camp in the north. They were ordered to leave their homes in October 2023. Active operations subsided, and they returned. They were once again ordered to evacuate in December 2023. Active operations subsided, and they returned. They were ordered again to evacuate in May 2024. Active operations subsided, and they returned. And just these months, they were once again ordered to evacuate. The conclusion is clear. There is something fundamentally wrong in the way this war is being conducted. Ordering civilians to evacuate does not keep them safe if they have no safe place to go and no shelter, food, medicine or water. And no place is safe in Gaza and no one is safe. International law is unambiguous. Civilians everywhere must be respected and protected and their essential needs must be met, including through humanitarian assistance. All hostages must be released. And I strongly condemn all violations of international humanitarian law in Gaza. Meanwhile, southern Gaza is overwhelmed. Supplies are running low and Israeli authorities are only allowing a single unsafe road for aid from the Kerem Shalom crossing, where humanitarians face active hostilities and violent armed looting, fueled by desperation and the collapse of public order and safety. I've warned for months of the risks of the conflict spreading, and the Middle East is a powder keg with many parties holding the match. The situation in the occupied West Bank is boiling over. And now in Lebanon, attacks, including on civilians, are threatening the entire region. Over the last few days, exchanges of fire between Hezbollah and others in Lebanon and the Israel Defense Forces have intensified across the Blue Line in total disregard of Security Council Resolution 1701 and 1559. Large-scale Israeli strikes deep into Lebanon, including Beirut, have killed more than 2,000 people over the last year and 1,500 in just the past two weeks alone. The toll has already surpassed the, 20, the, 20, zero, the, 20, the 2006 war in Lebanon. Attacks by Hezbollah and others south of the Blue Line have killed at least 49 people over the last year. Lebanese authorities report over 1 million people have been displaced in Lebanon and 300,000 people have fled into Syria. Over 60,000 people remain displaced from northern Israel. Recently, the IDF started the incursions across the Blue Line. We are on the verge of an all-out war in Lebanon with already devastating consequences. But there is still time to stop. The sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries must be respected. And members of our own peacekeeping force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, continue to carry out their mandates to the extent possible. The mission relies on full compliance by all parties. And I want again to express my gratitude and admiration to our peacekeepers and troop contributing countries. The men and women of UNIFIL are serving in what is today the most challenging environment for peacekeepers anywhere. All actors must ensure their safety and security and we must do far more on the humanitarian front. The 426 million US dollars humanitarian aid appeal for Lebanon is only 12% funded. I urge donors to step up. Dear ladies and gentlemen of the media, the conflict in the Middle East is getting worse by the hour 
and our warnings about the horrific impacts of escalation keep coming to pass. Every airstrike, every missile launch, every rocket fired pushes peace further out of reach and makes the suffering even worse for the millions of civilians caught in the middle. That is why we cannot and will not give up on our calls for an immediate ceasefire both in Gaza and Lebanon, the immediate and unconditional release of hostages and the immediate life-saving aid to all those who desperately need it. And that is why we cannot and will not give up on our calls for irreversible action for a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. All people in the region deserve to live in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, Nabil Abisab, Al Arabi TV station. Um, yesterday, uh, the Iranian foreign minister in Beirut said, uh, for the ceasefire to take place in Lebanon, it should first take place in Gaza. Do you think this is a constructive position and helps to reach a political solution? And what's the first step uh, about 1701, the roadmap to re implement 1701? What's, what should be the first step? We are asking for a ceasefire both in Gaza and in Lebanon. Thank you. Uh, Yvonne Murray, Irish Television. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General. Yvonne Moriarty, News. My question is about, you mentioned UNIFIL and the peacekeepers there. As you know, the Israeli army, the IDF, has set up a firing position right adjacent to Outpost 652, where Irish soldiers are currently stationed. What are your concerns now as the fighting move forward, uh, moves northwards towards larger UNIFIL camps? We are naturally very concerned. Yesterday, I had the chance to speak with your Prime Minister, and after that, I did a number of demarches uh, with different entities, and uh, I can now tell you that uh, those uh, Israeli tanks and other uh, armed elements that were around the 652 uh, position have left. Thank you very much. And I strongly appeal, strongly appeal to both parties to fully respect the safety and security of UNIFIL. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Has the Prime Minister written back? Good evening. Bonsoir. Shalom. Thank you, Adam. Merci à tous ceux qui se joignent à nous aujourd'hui pour rendre hommage aux victimes et aux survivants de l'attaque terroriste du 7 octobre perpétrée par Hamas. Et surtout, merci à la Fédération juive d'Ottawa d'avoir organisé cette cérémonie solennelle et d'une très grande importance. Thank you to the parliamentarians from all parties who are putting partisanship aside to be here today, including members from my cabinet. Ministers Bill Blair, Melanie Joly, Arif Varani, Mark Miller, Karina Gould, Jenna Suds, Terry Beach, Kamal Kara, Randy Boissonneau, Marcy Ian, Richie Valdez, Ahmed Hussein, and Stephen McKinnon, along with MPs Yasser Nakvi, Anita Vandenbelt, Marie-France Lalonde, Julie de Bruson, Valerie Bradford, Francesco Cerbara, Judy Scro, Terry Duguid, Lisa Hepner, Ali Esassi, and Joyce Murray. Three hundred and sixty-five days ago, we were all shaken to our very cores as we, Canadians, woke up on a peaceful autumn morning. Israelis and Jews across the globe were living a nightmare. Twelve hundred innocents murdered. Young revelers with their whole lives, whole lives ahead of them slaughtered. Entire communities burnt to the ground. Children traumatized and orphaned. Women raped and mutilated. Families shattered and broken. Over 250 people forced into captivity at the barrel of a gun. A single deadliest day for Jews 
since the Holocaust. I want to sit with that for a second. Almost 80 years since the end of the Holocaust. Almost 80 years since we collectively said never again. Terrorist organizations like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps still seek to harm Jews just because they are Jews. That's not being a freedom fighter. It's terrorism. Vile, anti-Semitic terrorism. And it makes me sick to my stomach. But the trauma of that day did not end on October 8th. What makes this barbaric attack that much more agonizing is the fact that you are reliving this nightmare every single day. You relive it when cowards shoot and smash the windows of your schools and synagogues in the middle of the night. You relive it when anti-Semites wave the flags of Hamas and Hezbollah in the streets of our cities. You relive it when too many of our fellow Canadians downplay or dismiss your pain, telling you that the generational trauma you carry and the anti-Semitism you experience somehow isn't real. You relive it when the term Zionist is tossed around as a profanity, a label for something other than what it truly means, believing in the right Jewish people, like all people, to determine their own future, a right this government supports and always will. No one in Canada should ever be afraid to proudly call themselves a Zionist. Somewhat ironically, you relive it when you must conceal the location of this very event for fear of violence. Let me be frank. I believe it is unacceptable for any of this behavior to be normalized. It is incumbent on me and on every leader, from premiers to police chiefs, to give anti-Semitism no quarter to stop this rising hate and to reverse its spread. And yet, in spite of the pain that you live with every day, you've all shown your remarkable resilience. In the hours immediately after October 7th, you came together as a community to stand by each other to help those displaced by the attacks and the hostage families going through untold suffering. You've shown that the depravity of these terrorists will not break your spirit, that they will not take away your joy. You continue to proudly embody the motto that defines what it means to be a Jew, Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. Par-dessus tout, je sais que vous continuerez à vivre ce cauchemar. Vous aurez le sentiment qu'il vous manque une partie de vous-même jusqu'à ce que les 101 otages qui se trouvent encore à Gaza soient libérés. 101 personnes dont la vie est toujours en jeu, 101 personnes qui subissent des tortures, des sévices et des humiliations inimaginables. C'est tout simplement inacceptable. Nous devons mettre fin à ce conflit, accroître l'aide humanitaire destinée aux centaines de milliers de Gazaouis qui souffrent, faire en sorte que le Hamas dépose ses armes et abandonne le contrôle de Gaza et ramener les otages chez eux dès maintenant. Nous devons, une fois pour toutes, rejeter cette violence qui n'apporte que mort et destruction et bâtir un avenir meilleur et plus sécuritaire 
pour les Israéliens comme pour les Palestiniens. Before I conclude, I want to take a step back, look beyond the horrifying numbers and statistics, and remember the people. Remember Vivian Silver, a Canadian-Israeli women's rights and peace activist who devoted her life to building bridges between Israelis and Palestinians. Souvenez-vous d'Alexandre Luc, un jeune homme qui venait de chez moi à Montréal et qui a perdu la vie en tentant de protéger les autres personnes lors du festival de musique Nova. Souvenez-vous de Netta Epstein, un amoureux de la nature très fier de son héritage canadien qui, sans hésiter, a sauté sur une grenade pour sauver sa fiancée. Remember Judith Weinstein, a compassionate mother of four whose family spoke glowingly about what an incredible person she was when I had the honor of meeting them a few months ago. Let us remember 1,200 innocent souls taken from us far too soon. May their memory be a blessing, but more than that, May their memory be a revolution, a revolution to bring about a world where violent Jew hatred, like the attacks of October 7th, are unimaginable. Merci beaucoup, mes chers amis. Shalom. Merci. Thank you. Today, our ears are filled with the echo of horror. Our eyes are darkened with the shade of genocidal cruelty. 365 days ago today, we saw exacted upon the Jewish people the worst and most deadly attack since the Holocaust, an attack carried out by a genocidal death cult, Hamas, they targeted, deliberately targeted civilians, children. They burned people alive, tortured children in front of their parents. They mutilated dead bodies. And then they displayed their cruel, sadistic, diabolical horrors in posts that they would put on the internet, not even trying to conceal their evil. And why did they do it? Not because there was an occupying force they were trying to expel. Israel had voluntarily expelled itself from Gaza 15 years ago through the incredibly painful and even controversial decision to arrest its own citizens and drag them out of the Gaza Strip into Israel proper, leaving Hamas the ability to govern that land without any interference whatsoever from Israel, but with, of course, total occupation by the terrorist regime in Tehran. And why now? Why at this moment, suddenly, after 15 years? Was it because war was breaking out? Exactly the opposite. It was because peace was breaking out. Israel. Israel had just successfully signed the Abraham Accords with multiple Muslim Arab states with momentum towards a potential deal with Saudi Arabia. Imagine that, the Jewish state signing a peace deal with the home of Mecca and Medina. What a bright new era that would be for everyone, everyone except for the tyrants of Tehran, for which such peace would be their worst nightmare. And so, to interrupt the potential of that harmony, the instigated, planned, financed, and coordinated this direct assault, and since that time, have unleashed a seven-front war on the Israeli people, a war that has been relentless and cruel. But before we talk further about that, let us take a moment 
to honor the victims, let their memories be a blessing, to think of the courageous hostages and their families in anguish. Bring them home. And yet, Jews here at this home are re-victimized again and again. After watching the Jewish homeland torn apart by this genocidal attack, now they see, they see the same motives and vicious hatred carried out on our very streets, with a staggering increase in hate crimes, most of them directed at the Jewish people. Why now? Why now? Now, we might say, well, of course, because tensions are inflamed by the war between Hamas and Israel. But wait, this is not the first war that Israel has had to fight. There have been countless wars where Israel has had to defend its very existence. And those wars did not spill onto Canadian streets. In 2000, it's true. It's true. In 2008 and 2007, 2006, when Israel was forced to fight back against Hezbollah in Lebanon, there was no violence on our streets. We did not have hate crimes overtaking Jewish communities, protests at Jewish hospitals, Jewish homes, Jewish businesses. When there was conflict again in 2014, that did not spill into our streets. So why now? Why all of a sudden has this hatred found such a home here in Canada? Now, some say it's because our people are flawed. The government needs to fix the people, censor the people, better control and corral the people. Well, is it really the people who are the problem? It wasn't the people who appointed Laith Maruth an anti-racism expert, after he had said, and I quote, life is too short for shoes with laces or for entertaining Jewish white supremacists with anything but a bullet in the head. Given a Government of Canada grant, this individual supposedly to fight racism. Or Birju Dutani, appointed as the commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, after he wrote, Terror is, an, is not an irrational strategy pursued solely by fundamentalists with politically and psychologically warped visions of a new political, religious, or ideological order. It is, in fact, a rational and well-calculated strategy that is pursued with surprisingly high success rates. The head of our Human Rights Commission. Or an Ontario school that forced children to attend an anti-Israel protest. Kids divided and told to wear different colors to identify their ethnicity in Canada. My friends, this ideology that seeks to divide our people based on race and ethnicity, that has led to these horrifying outbursts of hatred, are not from the bottom up. They are from the top down. And it has been further accentuated by a government that has let in someone who appears to have been let into Canada and given citizenship to someone who appeared to be in a video mutilating a, a citizen on a crucifix in the Middle East on behalf of ISIS, someone who then went on to try and stage another attack in Canada. Yet another terrorist came into Canada preparing to stage an attack from Canada to Jews in New York. All of this while well, our tax dollars fund UNRWA, an organization that has helped carry out the attacks of 9-11, uh, of October 7th. So, when they say that the government needs to be the watchman of the people. I say, who watches the watchman? 
I say, it is not for the government to change the people, it is time for the people to change the government. When I stand here today with, you, with my brilliant and courageous heroine deputy leader, the great Melissa Lanceman, and reiterate the commitment that I've made to you and that I've made to our Muslim brothers and sisters, and that is that we will always take one stand. No matter where we are, we as conservatives will say the same thing. I love the Muslim people, and when I go into their mosques, and I do proudly visit their mosques, I tell them I am a friend of Israel. I say the same things there that I do here. We can no longer accept political parties sending one MP into one place to say one thing and another MP into a different place to say exactly the opposite. We will put behind us this ugly ideology that has divided our people, and we will reclaim the country that we knew and love. And we will do it based on the teachings of the great Wilfrid Laurier, if, you'll mind, if you don't mind me praising a liberal. He was asked, what is Canada's nationality? And he could not list an ethnicity or a religion. We were already mixed up way back then. We had people from all over the world. So he said, Canada is free, and freedom is its nationality. We united around the idea that it didn't matter where you came from, it mattered where you were going. We united around the idea that you could worship God in any way you chose, that you had the freedom to think what you wanted, say what you wanted, be who you wanted, and to be left in peace with your family. And that is the principle that will unite us again. You have my word that I will stand up for freedom here at home and around the world. We will secure our borders to keep terrorists out. We will. Def I will make clear to universities that if they spread anti-Semitism or make Jews feel unsafe and uncomfortable on their campuses, they will not be eligible for federal funding. We will defund anti-Semitic organizations and activists. We will defund UNRWA and give the money to the Palestinian people who are suffering. I will, I will vote against anti-Israel resolutions at the United Nations. I will back Israel's right to defend itself, which includes retaliating against those that attack Israel. Israel must be able to prevent Isra Iran from using nuclear weapons if necessary. That means proactively striking Iranian nuclear sites and oil installations to defund the terrorist regime. We will keep our fists closed to terrorism, but our hands open to peace. We must work with the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, and anyone who's willing to talk and work and build towards a greater peace, including the permanent recognition of Jewish, the Jewish state's right to exist as a Jewish state now and forever. This is the bright future we have in store, in a land where all the Abrahamic people can enjoy their religious places of worship in peace and in harmony, the way Canada once was. That is the way that we can rekindle the memories of those brilliant souls that we lost a year ago today. I was speaking with Rabbi Mendel Kaplan, and I asked, how do I address the loss and find some glimmer of hope in it? And he said that those we lost can live on, on this world, in this world, even as they've passed into the next. And I said, how? He said, by carrying on the Jewish traditions that animated them. He said, a thousand years from now, we can honor them by having an Israel 
that carries on the traditions that have been there a thousand years before. We just passed the new year. It's 5,785. So together with the rabbi wrote a little poem about what Israel will look like in 6,785. Against all odds, Israel stands strong. Friends by her side, where they belong. In 6785, we'll see her people, firm, eternal, free, as Shabbat, as Shabbat candles flicker bright, mothers welcome Friday night, their flames a beacon ages old, a thousand more, this story told. The shofar's call at Rosh Hashanah echoes through time, a sacred drama, awakening souls since times of yore, a thousand years and many more. On Yom Kippur, in solemn prayer, they cleanse the slate with tender care, repairing bonds with, with the divine, traditions lasting past our time. Masuza's guard, each doorway's frame, yarmulkes worn without shame. Stars of David, proud and bright, eternal symbols of their might. The Jewish people tried and true on Simcha Torah, spirits renew, dancing with scrolls, joy undenied. Shema Yisrael, they've always cried. All foes who sought to break their will now lie defeated, cold and still, condemned to history's trash they fall, forgotten, they're disowned by all. Yet Israel's children stand, keeping alive throughout the land the memory of those who fell in Jewish hearts, their stories dwell. Unbroken, they'll endure each test, their timeless faith forever blessed. The culture and tradition never die, and still they'll say, Am Yisrael Hai. Thank you. Okay, good to see you. I'll start in English and then I'll go to French. So first and foremost, of course, I would like to reiterate how much I personally and this government is again any, any form of anti-Semitism. And we know that there's been a rise of anti-Semitism across this country. It has worsened since October 7th. We've heard from the Jewish community from coast to coast to coast how much this was a problem. And we need to continue to fight every day, working with mayors across the country, working with premiers, and of course, we have, as a government, to do a better job. And we all have to do a better job, everyone in the House of Commons. And so we'll continue to denounce any form of anti-Semitism that is happening on our streets, in our schools, against hospitals, synagogues, etc. Why? Because we, as a government, believe also in the Charter in the fact that freedoms need to be protected, not only freedom to speech, but also freedom from intimidation, violence, discrimination. Now, when it comes to the leader of the opposition, Pierre Poliev himself, let me be clear. What we saw yesterday was the height of our hypocrisy. Clearly, Poliev is doing one thing and saying one thing and he's doing another. I'll give you three examples. First, while well, he's saying that he's fighting anti-Semitism, he never condemned those who were waving a Nazi flag during the Freedom Convoy on this Parliament Hill. Why didn't he? Second, he cozies up to groups like Diagolon, who spread neo-fascist ideology across this country. Why does he denounce their anti-Semitism as well? And also, when his caucus met with far-right politicians from Germany that were downplaying Hitler's crimes, he kept, in, kept them in his caucus, and they're still sitting next to him in the House of Commons. So clearly, what we're seeing is that 
Pierre Poiliev is about double standards, and he's about himself, his own political gain, and ultimately, he's unfit to govern this country. I'll say it in French. Bien entendu, il va tout être le gouvernement, on est contre toute forme d'antisémitisme. Toute forme d'antisémitisme qu'on voit dans nos rues, qui vise la communauté juive, et on le sait très bien que l'antisémitisme est en croissance partout à travers le pays, particulièrement depuis le 7 octobre. Et c'est inacceptable. Et moi-même et notre gouvernement, nous allons toujours le dénoncer. Et nous devons travailler avec les maires, les maires de Montréal, maires d'un peu partout à travers le pays, avec les premiers ministres. Et bien entendu, nous devons travailler tous ensemble pour faire un meilleur boulot, parce qu'on doit contrer ce fléau. Ce n'est pas une question politique, c'est une question morale. Alors, nous allons continuer d'agir et de le dénoncer. Et en même temps, ce qu'on va faire, c'est qu'on va continuer à défendre la Charte des droits et libertés. Parce que c'est ce que le gouvernement libéral, nous, on croit. On croit que les gens doivent avoir le droit, la liberté d'agir, de parler, mais aussi, ils doivent être protégés de la liberté des autres. Et il n'y a certainement pas de droit d'intimider ou de violenter ou de, de discriminer. Et c'est ce qui unit notre pays et c'est ce qui fait partie de notre legs, nous, en tant que gouvernement libéral. Mais lorsque vient la question de Pierre Poliev, Pierre Poliev, lui, il dit qu'il combat l'antisémitisme. Mais la réalité, c'est que c'est deux poids, deux mesures. Premièrement, Pierre Poliev, il dit qu'il bat contre l'antisémitisme, mais en même temps, il n'a jamais dénoncé les gens qui flottaient un drapeau sur la colline parlementaire durant le convoi de la liberté, qui était un drapeau nazi. Il n'a jamais dit rien à l'époque. Encore aujourd'hui, il ne dit rien. Il doit le dénoncer. Deuxièmement, son caucus, les membres de son caucus se sont assis avec des politiciens allemands d'extrême droite qui sont venus au pays, dont L'objectif était de banaliser les crimes commis par Hitler. Les membres de son caucus n'ont subi aucune conséquence. Ils sont assis encore à côté de lui, dans la Chambre des communes. Et troisièmement, Pierre Poliev, ben, il se tient avec des groupes comme Diagolon, qui font la promotion d'idéologies néo-fascistes un peu partout à travers le pays, et qui sont au cœur de l'antisémitisme qu'on voit partout à travers le pays. Et donc, Lorsqu'on pense à Pierre Poliev, ce n'est pas compliqué. Et est tout, tout est basé sur lui-même et tout est basé aussi sur ses propres gains politiques. Donc, clairement, ce gars-là, il n'est pas fait pour diriger le pays. Je veux juste reiterer un couple de choses que le ministre Jolie a dit. C'est inacceptable et c'est wrong to see anti-Semitic protests in our streets. And it is wrong to denounce Canada and to say the things that we heard over the past 24 hours in our country. But when it comes to Mr. Polyev, he is lying to Canadians when he is talking about what is happening in the chamber. He is pretending that what is going on in there is something completely different than what it is which is a conservative filibuster of conservative obstruction. The Speaker of the House was extremely clear when he ruled on the conservative question of privilege. He said that because of the extraordinary circumstances, this should go to committee for further study. There is only one political party that is holding things up in the House of Commons right now, and that is the Conservative Party of Canada, because they are afraid that if this study goes to committee, What they will hear from experts is that this is an egregious abuse of power. But this is a consistent pattern with Pierre Polyev and his conservative party, where they obstruct the truth, they try to spin away from reality, but the facts don't lie. The facts are, and any one of you can go and read this testimony, this ruling from the speaker, where he clearly states that this matter should be referred to the Procedure and House Affairs Committee for further study. And Mr. Polyev doesn't want that to happen because when that happens, expert after expert will come out and say that this is an egregious abuse of power 
by the Conservatives, and just because the House has the right to do it, does not mean that it should. Monsieur Poliev est en train de ne pas dire la vérité aux Canadiens. C'est clair qu'il veut continuer d'obstruire son propre obstruction dans la Chambre de communes. Il ne dit pas la vérité aux Canadiens de, avec ce qui se passe dans la Chambre dans ce moment. Et ça, c'est une patron du leader et son parti conservateur qu'on voit jour après jour ici dans cette Chambre. Et il y a une raison que je crois qu'il ne veut pas suivre la direction qui a donné le président de la Chambre, qui était très claire. On voit cette motion au comité pour qu'on puisse l'étudier plus parce que c'est un abus de pouvoir. Et il ne veut pas que ça arrive parce que ça va être clair. Expert et expert va dire que c'est un abus du pouvoir et c'est inacceptable de ce qui fait le leader de chef des conservateurs. Et les Canadiens sont intelligents. Ils savent quand quelqu'un est en train de dire la vérité. Et je sais que M. Poliev sait ça aussi. Et c'est pourquoi il est en train d'essayer de faire des, des, des confusions sur ce qui arrive. Mais la réalité, c'est que nous sommes là on veut travailler, on veut envoyer cette matière au, au comité, puisque nous pourrions à, terminer avec le travail qu'on a besoin de faire pour les Canadiens. Madame Merci. Jolie, oui, Madame Jolie, juste une chose. De... Oui, juste si vous n'avez rien à vous reprocher là, pour ces documents qui touchent ce fond vert, pourquoi vous ne les envoyez pas seulement à la GRC, si, comme parti, vous n'avez rien à vous reprocher? Euh, le gouvernement euh, est toujours là pour euh, travailler avec le GRC, mais ce n'est pas la procédure appropriée. La Chambre de commune euh, ne peuvent pas demander ces, docu ils peuvent demander ces documents, mais c'est la première fois dans l'histoire du Canada, donc il va l'envoyer au GRC sans la procédure ju judiciaire, sans l'indépendance de le GRC. C'est le GRC même et l'auditrice générale qui ont dit que ce n'est pas correct, que ce n'est pas comment nous travaillons dans une démocratie. Et je m'excuse, mais je dois aller parce que la période de questions commence et je dois être là. Merci. Madame Jolie, vous pouvez rester. Oui. Oui. Le, sur ben, M. Poilievre, oui. Poilievre, il vous demande de, de, de vous excuser, vous, parce que vous avez refusé de condamner les, les, les slogans. Pourquoi est-ce que vous ne faites pas juste condamner les slogans? Mais je les condamne! Ce... Je les condamne à tous les jours. Premièrement, lorsque vient la question de l'antisémitisme, je le condamne. Le, le Hamas est un groupe terroriste. On a sanctionné le Hamas. J'ai dit hier que, justement, on condamnait le Hamas. Ça faisait partie des premières choses que j'ai dites lors de ma réponse, après avoir nommé les huit Canadiens qui ont été tués. Donc, je n'ai pas de problème à condamner le Hamas. Je n'ai pas de problème à condamner l'antisémitisme. Pourquoi lui, il n'est pas capable? Of course. I've been calling upon that uh, for the last year. Um, and uh, there's a national security review being done on Sam Adun, and it absolutely should be a terrorist organization. It promotes hatred. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's a spokesperson for a list of terrorist organization. Uh, and its activities over the last few days have only made it very clear that, uh, that, that it has to be done. What do you think of the ongoing dispute between the Foreign Affairs Minister and Mr. Polyev? Uh, is Melanie Jolie pandering to... I'm not going to comment about... You, you can ask me a substantive question. I'm not going to talk about personalities. Anti-Semitism in this country is a serious issue. The demonstrations have had anti-Semitic rhetoric that has been floated out. And, uh, and to use October the 7th, a, a day where 1,200 Israelis were murdered, uh, the worst day for Jews since the Holocaust, to to do what was done in a number of places yesterday and, and to make anti-Semitic in statements and glorifying terrorism and glorifying what happened on October 7th is an absolutely horrendous thing that should not happen in Canada. And anyone who was part of those demonstrations, what happened at McGill where a building was vandalized, it, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful. Um, so whatever differences there are between the parties, I think and I hope we all agree that October 7th is, is, is a day that has to be remembered Uh, for what happened and not used by, uh, by people who don't like Israel to, uh, to, to terrorize people in Canada. How optimistic are you that Sebastian will be designated a terrorist organization? I'm very optimistic. I believe that what Sam Adun has done justifies it. And I'm confident our national security agencies and, and then cabinet will, will take the right steps.
Look, I, I would have look. I would have liked it to be done a year ago. Uh, we, you know, but but we. I mean, I don't believe that politicians can control when the national security agencies report back and what they say. But uh, again, I think it needs to be done expeditiously. I know the minister. I've talked to him, if not hundreds of times. Uh, you know, more than fifty times about this issue, and I'm very confident uh, he sees it the way that I do. Mr. Holly, said yesterday. Uh, look, I, I've taken uh, positions a number of times that are different than my government on Israel. I think Israel has an absolute right to defend itself against Iran and its terrorist proxies. And I think Iran having nuclear weapons is a great danger for the world. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. I'd, I think I'd have to um, read uh, and better understand some of the things that they're doing. Um, but probably a strong case to be made. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, or I should ask you, what do you think overall about this back and forth that we've seen in the last couple of days with Mr. Palmeda and your foreign affairs minister? I spoke to 1,500 people in Winnipeg yesterday from the Jewish community. Uh, I sat in a memorial service with 600 people at an all-Jewish school with the student population and the teachers in Winnipeg. Parents pulled up to the school that moment, uh, that morning and dropped their kids off in the backdrop of police cars and police officers because of the rise in anti-Semitism. This place is about politics and I can appreciate that to an extent, but um, I would prefer uh, that we keep ourselves focused on um, people that are being impacted on the ground and I think that uh, um, there's a lot in our political discourse these days particularly around the issue of the Middle East that is um, not only proving to be divisive but also uh, distracting from I think the important conversations that we have to have and the important reparation that needs to happen uh, amongst community members across the country so I'm not going to provide any further comment um, I think you've seen how I engage on this issue and it's not the way I, I choose to engage and I hope that uh, my colleagues broadly speaking, uh, will um, always choose to depoliticize uh, sensitive matters whenever the opportunity arises for them to do that. Okay. Well, it is, that's a lot of politics too. Um, on this one, um, you know, I'm not going to speak too much because as chair of PROC, uh, you know, there's a good chance that uh, this will come to us and my job is to be an objective uh, observer and a decision maker uh, on that front, but um, it seems to me that the speaker's ruling is uh, relatively clear. And uh, now the usual back and forth of um, you know who the political onus rests on will play out for a little bit. I think my, uh, some of my colleagues are certainly aware of uh, how much time can be eaten up and taken away from the legislative agenda as this conversation ensues. But uh, should it come to proc, uh, if that's the prerogative of uh, the, the chamber, uh, as for the speaker's recommendations, and I'm certainly uh, looking forward to having that conversation. I'm sure it'll be an interesting one. Okay, thanks, Thank guys. You. Yeah. Um, what did you want to add about? It? Well, you know, you had asked me the question about whether or not I thought they should be listed as a terrorist organization, and that's not really a decision for me as an individual member of parliament to make. There's <laughs> protocol in place and criteria that needs to be undertaken in order to establish whether or not a group ought to be listed a terrorist entity. But what I can say with certainty is that. What we have seen members of this organization do and say is not only reprehensible and has no place in Canada and needs to be condemned in the strongest of terms loudly by elected officials and grassroots everyday Canadians from coast to coast to coast, but it seems to me that there is likely a very strong case to be made that there are uh, uh, hate crimes that are being committed in the context of what they are doing and saying. Like I said about whether or not they ought to be established as a terrorist entity, that decision is not one for me to make. That's obviously one for the police to determine if they believe that a law is being broken and for the courts to enforce, uh, or sorry, for the courts to rule on uh, following that enforcement. Um, so 
even though it's not up to me as an individual member of parliament to decide, um, that does not take away from very strong uh, feeling that I have towards what they are doing and saying, and my belief that what they are doing and saying, Sammy doing that is, uh, does not belong in Canada, and that there needs to be a much stronger vocalization of that from everybody, inclusive of ordinary Canadians across the country. And I guess your government uh, is undertaking a review. It sounded like today Jennifer O'Connell said that it was being passed along to uh, the National Security Advisor. I can't speak to that. I'm not aware of exactly where things are at in the process. Um, so again, I, I do think as individual members of Parliament, we have to be very careful to say, yeah, I think I, just because I despise this group and what they're doing, I think they should be called terrorists. Um, we can say that what they are doing is terrorizing people, but to take the step of actually categorizing them as a terrorist uh, group within Canada is obviously a substantial one, and we do have to ensure that rules uh, and procedure are followed. Like I said, though, short of making the determination that I think would be inappropriate to make because of those processes, I still think it's very much acceptable for somebody such as myself, other elected officials, regardless of political party, and Canadians across the country to strongly condemn what they're hearing and seeing. And I don't think that it is uh, crossing the line for us to say that they are terrorizing people uh, and that the actions that they are undertaking are... I would hope, in the minds of all Canadians, contrary to the values uh, that are instilled in us here as a people. I hope that adds some clarity. Thank okay, you. thanks, guys. has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.